Hi, I'm the History Guy, and if you didn't know, in addition to our page on YouTube, we also have a page on Patreon, where for just a few dollars a month, you can support the work of the History Guy. And one of the things that patrons on Patreon get is one episode a month that's exclusive for patrons, and occasionally, when we're on holiday like this week, we bring one of those episodes to the YouTube audience. Today you're going to get to see the first in a series I did for patrons chronicling my adventures as I traveled to the world famous Tank Museum in Dorset to film an episode of their series, Top 5 Tanks. I hope you enjoy, and if you do, please consider becoming a patron. In February I received an invitation from the Tank Museum in Dorset to host an episode of their series, Top 5 Tanks. It was great fun working with the folks at the Astounding Museum, but it was also an opportunity to spend some time with old friends who share my passion for history. I arrived at Heathrow Airport around 6 a.m. London time, landing at Terminal 2, which is also called the Queen's Terminal, which was just opened in 2014, replacing the old Terminal 2. Just outside the International Rivals is the astounding 230-foot, 76-ton sculpture called Slipstream, also completed in 2014 and meant to represent the movement of planes at an air show. Slipstream is currently the longest piece of permanent art and the largest privately funded sculpture in Europe. The friend that was picking me up had driven in from Wales, but we were meeting another friend from the United States who would not be arriving for a few hours, so we grabbed a quick breakfast and popped off to the British Museum. Established in 1753 and open to the public since 1759, the museum is huge and has an amazing collection that has been collected, or as some argue, looted from all over the world. I think that you could easily spend months exploring this museum and not see everything, but you could also spend just an hour or two and be sure to see some amazing things. There is no entry fee, so it's a great place to spend some free time if you happen to be around London. The museum was just opening for the day, but the queues were already long, so we skipped the Rosetta Stone and headed off for the Celtic and Roman exhibits, which were much less crowded. I got some great pictures of some Roman galia, which we discussed recently in an episode. We also got to see the amazing Sutton Hoo helmet, as well as the reproduction that showed what it looked like new. The Sutton Hoo helmet was an Anglo-Saxon artifact found in an excavation in Suffolk in 1939 and was possibly the most iconic piece in the excavation of a 7th century ship burial that has been described as one of the most significant archaeological finds in England for its size and completeness. We only had about three hours to spend at the museum, but it really reminded me how the British Museum is a must-see even if you have just a few hours to spend. But it was time to pick up our friend at Heathrow and head off to Wales. Wales is a lovely, very green place where they honestly think that this is a two-lane road. The Welsh are very friendly people who smile easily and are very likely to wish you a good day. While pretty much everyone speaks English, times are made both in Welsh or Camrag in English. The Welsh language is thought to have differentiated from other Britonic languages during the early Middle Ages and was the majority language in Wales until the early 20th century when it became a minority language and the number of speakers fell into sharp decline. The Welsh language was still declining as recently as 2011, but since 2000 the teaching of Welsh has been compulsory in all schools in Wales up to age 16. And as of 2019, surveys show that about a third of the Welsh population over the age of three now speaks Welsh. The phonology of Welsh is characterized by a number of sounds that do not occur in English and are rare in any European language, and as a result the language doesn't really pronounce how it is spelled, and written Welsh can look very strange to native English speakers, kind of like a cat walked across the keyboard. But the efforts by the Welsh government to preserve the Welsh language is an interesting example of preserving history, keeping it from being forgotten, in order to preserve Welsh identity, both in the present and in the future. After a much-needed rest and trying to shake off some jet lag, we headed off to Carfilly Castle, which is just north of the Welsh capital of Cardiff. The 13th century castle is quite extensive and remarkably well-preserved, even though there are some parts in ruin or collapse due to ground settling. Built by Gilbert de Clare, otherwise known as the Red Earl, Carfilly Castle was intended to protect the border and extend the authority of Edward I, who called Edward Longshanks, into Wales. The local Welsh opposed the move, and there were quite a lot of conflict at the site even before the castle was finished. The castle has a central fortification, surrounded by artificial lakes, which then had the dams fortified, creating concentric rings of defense. That was, at the time, a new concept that inspired the design of castles throughout Britain. The castle was the center of conflict through the 13th and 14th century, declined in the 15th century, and was partially restored in the 18th century. The castle is currently maintained and operated by CADU, which is the Historical Environment Division of the Cultural and Tourism Board of the Welsh Government. There's lots of room to wander and really get a feel for life in a medieval fortification. 
If you ever wanted to stand in a castle and reenact a scene from Monty Python in the Holy Grail, this is a good place for it. I'll tell him, but I don't think he'll be too keen. He's already got one, you see. Cadu has added some fun areas for kids at the castle, and this offensible bit that tells a Welsh tale about a king who ate a dragon egg and was transformed into a dragon. Next, we drove a little north and east to the village of Carleone, which is the home to quite a lot of history, but is probably most known as the location of Isca Augusta, a Roman legionary fortress originally established in 74 or 75 AD. The home of the Second Augustan Legion, the site was occupied by the Roman military until at least 300, although there is some evidence of an even later Roman presence. The area has been the scene of quite a lot of archaeology in the 20th century, notably discovering Roman baths, but also the foundations of the barracks, the only Roman legionary barracks visible in Europe. And there is a fantastic Roman amphitheater, the most complete in Britain, as well as still existing fortress walls. During the 12th century, a historian named Geoffrey of Monmouth described Carleone as the location of Arthur's Court of Camelot, and the Round Roman Amphitheater was for centuries thought to be the location of Arthur's famous Round Table. The site is also maintained by Cadu, and there's a small museum built around the baths. You can freely walk along the walls and explore the foundations of the barracks and amphitheater, and you can visit the National Roman Legion Museum, which was originally built in 1850, and I am told houses artifacts and finds from the fortress, but unfortunately the museum is closed this summer for roofing repair, so we were unable to see it. Coming from America, the history in Europe always impresses me. This is, by Welsh standards, new construction. We eat dinner in a place called the Priory, which is in a building originally constructed as a Cistercian monastery in the 12th century. We are very fortunate to get in. If you're coming this way, I recommend making reservations. And for the record, the food was crummy. We were heading to Dorset on Monday, and we were scheduled to film at the Tank Museum on Tuesday, but the drive was only a couple of hours, so we were able to spend the morning at Cardiff Castle. Located in the heart of the Welsh capital, Cardiff Castle was originally built as a Roman fort in the 3rd century. Norman invaders built a fortification on top of the Roman ruins starting in the 12th century, eventually expanding the fortifications into a significant fortress. Cardiff Castle was the scene of quite a lot of conflict between the Anglo-Normans and the local Welsh well into the 15th century, was involved in the English Civil War in the 17th century, and garrisoned even after the war to defend against invasion from Scotland. Its military history alone, spanning some 1500 years, would make Cardiff Castle one of the most interesting sites in Great Britain. But the castle was then restored and turned into a Gothic Revival mansion in the 19th century, making it a great representation of the lives of the Victorian aristocracy. In the hands of the Stuart dynasty under the Marquess of Butte, the castle is counted as among the most magnificent that the Gothic Revival ever achieved. Ironically, Gothic Revivalism, which was in essence a romantic revolt against machine production and the appearance of factory-made uniformity in the form of decoration hearkening to medieval times, was funded by the fortune that the Marquess was making in Welsh coal that was being used to fuel those factories. I do highly recommend paying extra for the tour, which gives you the best access to the magnificent Gothic Revival rooms, as well as learning the somewhat tragic history of the Butte family. But we were particularly lucky in that the Chaucer Room, which has been decorated in the theme of the Canterbury Tales, is now open to visitors after having been closed for the last 15 years. Ms. History Guy had elected not to come with us on this trip, and I think she may have regretted that decision when I sent her pictures of the castle library. The medieval part of the castle is still obvious not just in the walls, but the shell keep which stands in the middle of the fortress. The Buttes were interested in archaeology and restored some of the castle's older elements, and there is a great view from the top of the keep, which, while not as well preserved as Carfilly Castle, still has that medieval feel as well as steep staircases. The fourth Marquess had a Roman gatehouse restored in the 1920s, as you can literally walk between eras in this amazing site. And going into the Roman gatehouse, you can not only walk among medieval battlements, but can walk through the bunkers that were used as air raid shelters during the Second World War. Underneath the south gate, you can view not only parts of the original Roman walls, but can also visit a museum called Firing Line, the Cardiff Castle Museum of the Welsh Soldier. The museum houses the collections of the 1st the Queen's Dragoon Guards and the Royal Welsh Regiment. The museum displays quite a lot of artifacts and covers actions by the units from the Battle of Waterloo through the Victorian era and the World Wars up through the modern conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. The museum displays two original Victoria crosses from the Crimean War. Britain has quite a few of these regimental museums scattered about, and they always feel very personal, as the regiment and its history is very much about the experience of the soldier. 
The museum is full of uniforms, medals, and equipment of men who served throughout the empire. In fact, the museum is housed at Cardiff Castle partly because of one such man, the third Marquess's son, Lord Ninian Edward Crichton Stuart, who commanded the 6th Battalion of the Welsh Regiment. He was killed in action in October 1915, leading his battalion in the Battle of Lewes. Thank you to the great people at the world-famous Tank Museum in Dorset who gave us not just an opportunity to come and work with them in their extraordinary collection, but an excuse to go visit Wales and Southwest England. Go ahead and check out my episode of Top 5 Tanks on the Tank Museum YouTube page, and while you're there, make sure and subscribe. And I really hope that you enjoyed this behind-the-scenes look at how we do research at The History Guy. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.